but it's a thought I thought about, about a great deal about this week and, and how it can apply to our life. Uh, before I do that, there, I heard of once a story of a preacher who had been uh, preaching and he was real fired up in his sermon. And, and he said that if I, he got up and he shouted three times a, a statement like this, he, he said during his sermon, he said, if I had all the beer in the world, I'd throw it in the river. Then again during the sermon, he said, if I had all of the wine in the world, I'd throw it in the river. Again, he shouted out, he said, if I had all the whiskey in the world, I'd throw it in the river. And after he finished his sermon, he sat down, and the choir leader got up and said, now turn to hymn number 55, shall we gather at the river? Amen. <laughs> so it's not my joke. I've heard that joke this week, and I thought that was appropriate, you know, it's, you know, I'm a good for puns. I love puns, so I'm a sucker for a sucker for a good joke. So, but if you have your Bibles, Nehemiah, and it, it, basically this one verse says this. It says, whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet or shafar, join us there. Our God will fight for us. Now hold that, because we're, let me back up and explain. If you don't remember, Nehemiah was, in the book of Nehemiah, the cupbearer for King Artaxerxes. He was born in captivity. 93 years earlier, the Babylonians sacked Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, destroyed the walls, destroyed all the homes, carried everybody into exile, except for just a few left in the land. And so, like Jeremiah, the prophet, and so the whole city was destroyed. And Nehemiah, God placed that he heard about the condition, he, the condition of Jerusalem, probably thought in his mind, surely after all these years, Jerusalem is now a wonderful city on the shining hill. It's wonderful, and everything's just marvelous, and I can't wait to go one day to my homeland. But then he hears rumor, and here's the news, that the city is still in ruin. No one's ever built back up on it again. There's different nomads, different people's groups living in the area. But the people of the Hebrew people, the people of Israel, were not a nation again. And so the city was destroyed. And Nehemiah wept, and he cried, and he mourned, and he fasted, and he sought God for the answer. And then he knew that he had to do something. So being the cupbearer for the king, he was in a trusted position for the king Artaxerxes. King Artaxerxes was king of all Persia. If you remember in the movie 300, the Spartans went up against Artaxerxes. And they lost eventually. But then, but, but without a having that good movie, having that good story. But Nehemiah felt he should go to, before the king. But as he was serving the king his wine, uh, Artaxerxes noticed his countenance and noticed, noticed that something was wrong with Nehemiah. And so he inquired Nehemiah. Nehemiah told him the story and told him that how he, he had planned everything out, he laid everything out. He would like to go to his homeland, his land of heritage, to be able to rebuild the wall, at least the wall. Later on, Zerubbabel would be able to rebuild the temple, but he would start on that wall. And so God gave Nehemiah favor, and Nehemiah was allowed to go to the homeland from Persia, which is modern-day Iraq, Iran, to that of Jerusalem, which would take by camel months' journey time, a thousand miles. And go, and as he went, and he arrived, he wasn't met with great fanfare, but opposition. Opposition arose from Sanballat the Horonite, and Tobiah the Ammonite, and Geshem the Arab. And they all conspired to, to get at Nehemiah, to try to stop Nehemiah from rebuilding the walls. And they tried insults and threats, and even that of actual war. And Nehemiah, if you remember, issued a decree that as the people were working, some would stop and not work at all, and they would be guards and sentries, and they would be ones who would start in the front line of the battle, and the workers, they would work with tools in one hand and a spear to a sword to the side, and they would work expecting warfare at any moment. But nothing stopped and deterred them from working. That Nehemiah with God on his side, knew that the work would be finished. The work would be completed. The work would continue on. And that is what we must remember today. 
Today, if we can apply that to our Christian life, that Satan wants to destroy your work, that Satan wants to stop you from doing God's kingdom work in your life. There are many things that you may want to do for God and his kingdom that God has placed upon your heart. And you know that when you kneel in prayer, that that thing constantly comes to your mind that you have to do it. And you just can't let it go. And God's not going to let it go. And yet, so you must do it. But yet the enemy is going to throw those roadblocks. He's going to throw up those things in the way to stop you. The threats and all of that to get you from doing what God has called you to do for his kingdom. But isn't that why Jesus came? In 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, it says this. The reason why the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. The devil is always going to try to stop you. But Jesus has come to destroy the devil's work in our life. Amen. Right. And you too, empowered with Jesus living inside of you, can destroy the devil's work. But it was at the rally point that every Nehemiah and the men it said once they thought danger was coming, that the enemy's troops were coming against them, that they were to rally. And the rally point cry was that of the shofar, the trumpet, if you will. Now that's an inaccurate translation, trumpet. It really is in the Hebrew shofar. What is a shofar? A shofar, I brought one with me. It is the ram's horn. This, there's several types and several different kinds. There's even a short kind, which is very hard, it's harder to blow. But this one is my personal shafar that I've had for years and years and years of ministry. And it, I've practiced that, and I'll try to blow it for you, okay, at this sound. Probably woke everybody up in the hospital, huh? <laughs> but this is a shafar. It's made from the ant, horn of an antelope. And this shofar was to be blown and for everybody to rally a point. And they had a rally point. And so once they heard the shofar, everybody said, come here, stop what you're doing. And they were grab their weapons. And they were rallied for the fight. Prepare for battle. Today, I want you and I to realize that God has a shofar that he blows in heaven. The scripture is clear about that. In fact, it says that in Zechariah chapter 9 verse 14. It says, Then the Lord will appear over them. His arrow will flash like lightning. The sovereign Lord will sound the trumpet. Amen. The Lord himself will sound the trumpet. And he will march the shafar. And he will march in the storms of the south. And the Lord Almighty will shield them. Yes. Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 15 says this. That day will be like a day of, a day of distress and anguish. A day of trouble and a ruin. A day of darkness a gloom. A day of clouds and blackness. A day of trumpet, shafar, and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the corner towers. Realize that we are called to warfare. There is a calling in each and every one of our lives. We are not called to be a pacifist in our faith. We are called to be militants in our faith. We are called to be always on guard and at battle or at least at the posture of battle. We must always be prepared that the sound of the shofar, and we do know that the scripture tells us in Thessalonians that there is a trumpet call at the second coming, and the dead of Christ will rise in that trumpet call is the shofar blasts. So even at the second coming, there will be a giant shofar sound that you will be able to hear Amen. when Christ issues his second coming again. So what does that mean for us further? It means that we must rally together and prepare for battle. We need to prepare for battle. Again, let me read to you verse 17, 16 and 17 in Nehemiah 4. It says, From that day on, half my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. And then those who carried the materials did their work with the hand on one hand of the weapon and the other on their the plow or the shovel or pickaxe or whatever they were using. That we must prepare for battle. No matter what, that means no matter what you're doing, you're doing your daily jobs. You're doing your work each and every day, your, your professions, or you're ministering to your family, taking care of your family's needs. 
Remember this, that even at the same time, you must always be prepared for war. The enemy, our, the Satan, prowls around like a roaring lion, right? He wants to destroy your testimony. He wants to destroy your faith. And we as Christians must rally together in unity to be able to stop the work of Satan. Amen. It is remarkable in this passage that they rally together in unity. The people of God. What about us today? Are we unified as a body of Christ? We're not, are we? We have so many divisions. We have so many denominations. We have so many uh, breakups and splits and bickering and fighting, just like the halls of Congress and Senate, right? Sometimes uh, we do not really appear to be the people of God that we are. We need to rally together. And that's why I'm so grateful I'm an army chaplain. In the military, I get the privilege to work with people of other faith groups and other denominations and, and people of all different types to be able to, one pluralistic ministry, to be able to unify together. Now, I don't have to give up my scriptural convictions and doctrines and what my, my faith group tells me that, you know, that they want me to believe and what I believe in scripture. I don't do that. I don't have to compromise to respect somebody else, but I do respect them, and I do want to help them and unify together to get the mission done. And what's the mission for us here in this hospital? It's to bring God to soldiers and soldiers to God. It's to be able to miss the ministry of presence. It's to be able to help people of all faiths find the Lord. Amen. But when we're separate, when we're divided, we're easy targets for Satan to pick on. One illustration of that is Alvin York. I don't know if you remember who Alvin York is. Alvin York, during World War I, was a corporal, 1918. He was drafted, he was a strong Christian, but he was from the hills of the Tennessee and Eastern Kentucky line. And uh, being such a part of, raised in Tennessee in the mountains, he was an avid hunter, an expert hunter, expert shot. But when he was called and to draft it into the war, World War I, the war that ended all wars, as it was called back then, he didn't really want to go. He, didn't, he felt convicted that, that he was a Christian, and Christians shouldn't fight, shouldn't kill. And after being denied the conscientious objector status, he eventually surrendered his will. He thought, render unto Caesar what is Caesar into God's gods. And he draft, was drafted into the service of the military and sent to the to France, to the Meuse River in France and Ardun. And while there, on October 8, 1918, him and his squad came under heavy fire from machine gun fire. And nine of them died. In fact, his squad leader died as well. And he was left in charge. And after taking charge, he was pinned down, and he was being an expert shot, was able to see the Germans lifting up, popping up their heads, one by one. And just like back in the backwoods of Tennessee, being able to pick off turkeys in the turkey hunt, he was able to pick off the enemy, killing 20 of them. And he personally called, as he was shooting, personally called for them to surrender. And eventually, 132 Germans surrendered to him. This is his quote about that day. He says, those machine guns were spitting fire, cutting down the undergrowth all around me, something awful. I didn't have time to dodge behind the tree or dive into the bush. I didn't even have time to kneel or lie down. As soon as the machine guns opened fire on me, I began to exchange shots with them. In order to sight me or to swing their machine guns on me, the Germans had to show their heads above the trench. And every time I saw a head, I touched it off. All the time, I kept yelling for them to come down. I didn't want them, any of them to kill more than I had to. But it, it was either they or I. And I was giving them the best I had. Amen. In the end, for what he did, he was get, given the Medal of Honor. I promoted to sergeant. And later, years later, an Army movie, promotional for World War II, came out, starring Gary Cooper, with the title Sergeant Gore. If you haven't seen that movie, I encourage you to do so. It's a good, good movie. But the story in life of Sergeant York. But that just reminds me of how 
And once we're left individualized, once we're uh, not unified together, once we're separate and, and on our own, we are an easy march for Satan. That's why we need to pray together and unify together and be with one another. Because God will use us unified. But separate, so we're easy pickings for Satan to come at. A biblical example of that is in Judges chapter 7. The story of Gideon. Gideon went against the Midianites and he rallied together 32,000 men to be able to go against hundreds of thousands of Midianites. And that was, they were already outnumbered, but they knew God was on their side. Judges chapter 6 verse 16 says, God says, I will be with you and you will strike down the Midianites, leaving none alive. So he knew that God was with them and he was going to go up against 100,000 Midianites with just 32,000 men. But that wasn't what God wanted. God told the whittling down by a series of events of just 300. 300. Kind of like the 300 Spartans. Or I call it a special forces uh, detachment, if you will. This, this 300 men were to go against the hundreds of thousands of Midianites. But God told them to do something remarkable. To surround the camp in the middle of the night. They have torches inside clay pots and a shafar on the other hand. And when they all in unison were to shout, with a shout, blush, blow that shafar, crash the jars, and those torches lit up all around the Midianite camp. And they did it all in unison. And when they did, the Midianites awoke from the sleep and they start killing one another. And God gave Gideon victory that day because they were unified at the sound of the shafar. They were unified together. And God, with them, through them, struck down the Midianites. Realize this, that God gives you the ability and the power to overcome Satan. God gives you the ability to overcome all obstacles in your life. God gives you the ability. Why? Because the scripture tells us he will fight for us. He's going to fight for you. He's going to fight for me because he loves us. The Bible tells us in Joshua chapter 9, 1 verse 9. Be strong and courageous. Do not let you do not be terrified or discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, Surely I am with you always. So what? The very ends of the age. Romans 8, 37. You are more than conquerors through him who loves us. We are promised to be conquerors. And then he tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6. Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified or be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So how is it that we are to win? The key is God will fight for us. How does God fight for us? He is with us. He is in us through the Holy Spirit. We as Christians should not have to go through uh, times of depression and worry and anxiety and fear and dread and despair and hopelessness or even thoughts of suicide and death. We should not be able to go, should not have to go through all that. That's the thoughts of the enemy. Amen. That's thinking, thinking that gets in your head. And we play upon it. We have an almighty God who is with us no matter where we go in life. No matter what we go through in life, no matter how much we are suffering and we're in trials and tribulation, no how much we're in anguish, God is with us. He may seem far and distant from you, but he's there. His promise, his word is true. He is there with us every step of the way, every day in your life. God is with you. He's crazy about you. He loves you. He wants the very best for you in life. No fallen angel, no demon in hell, no demonic dominion will be able to deter you from God and his kingdom. That God loves you so much, he sent his son to die on the cross for you. He loves you so much, he sent his son Jesus to this earth to die for us. So what is our shafar? We may not have a literal shafar. But what is your shafar today? It is shouts of praise. 
It is your praise to the Lord for all that he has done in our life. Psalms 81 says this, Sing for joy to the Lord, all our strength. Shout aloud to the God of Jacob. Sound the ram's horn at the new moon when the moon is full and the day of our feast. This is a decree for Israel. Jesus even said this about when, the, when he triumphantly rode into Jerusalem and the people were shouting those hosannas and the teachers of law was trying to shut them up and say, the rabbi stopped them from uh, shouting your praises. This is blasphemy. And Jesus even said in Luke chapter 19, verse 40, I tell you that he replied that even if, this, if, if they keep quiet, the stones will shout out praises. Realize this, that we have a mighty God who fights for us and who loves us and he will do anything for us, so much so he went to the cross of Calvary for us. Our God will fight for you. Amen. No matter what you're going through. Sometimes we don't understand. We say a prayer to God, we don't understand those prayers, the answers to those prayers. Sometimes we God, because God is higher than our thoughts. Amen. We want the fleshly here and now. We want our wants and our desires like Burger King, my way right away. And that's not how God operates. God operates in his own timing, which is always right. In his own manner, in his own way, in his own will for our lives. But he is working and he is there. And you have the assurance that he is there through the scriptures. Lastly, the enemy will be destroyed. The works of the enemy will be destroyed. Nehemiah knew this. That they were going to be victorious. Even if they had to resort to warfare. The enemy would be destroyed because God was with them. Notice, though, after Nehemiah chapter 4, after this event, they were no longer threatened anymore. The enemy backed off. The enemy fleed from them, fled from them. What is that? When the Bible tells us that we need to resist the devil and what? And James, he will flee from us. Does that mean a... Does that mean a walking away? Does that mean a slithering away? Does that mean like a sulking away? No. It means a flea and literally running of it. That he is sprinting away from us. It's like the 100 yard dash in record time. When you resist the devil, he will flee from you. Just like the, this unholy trinity that came against Nehemiah and the people groups there. It's not our strength, but it's not by my power, by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Zechariah 4 6. God is going to confuse the enemy as he did in the Old Testament and New Testament. He's going to totally rout the enemy and he's going to give you the victory. You already have the victory in Jesus Christ. Amen. How much so are you going to have the victory in your daily lives? Yes, there are times when we're going to suffer. Yes, there's times that we're going to go through stuff. Yes, there's times we're going to go through times of health and also sickness. Yes, there's times we're going to go through prosperity or poverty. Yes, there's times we're going to go through a myriad of different things in our lives. God nowhere ever in the scripture tells us that we're going to have a cushy couch potato life. There's no such thing as armchair quarterbacks in Christianity. But it's people who are willing to get in the battle. Even the people of Israel had to fight. Nehemiah had to get ready to fight. Gideon had to get ready to fight and prepare for battle. Joshua had to prepare for a fight. All the peoples of Israel, when they had to go against an enemy, they had to get in the fight. But while they were in the fight, God was with them. It doesn't say, as the psalmist it says, Though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. You are with me every step of the way in the battle. So those valleys of death and despair, you are with me. When I'm grieving and I'm mourning and suffering loss, you are with me. When I'm struggling and don't know where to turn, you are with me. God is with us. So we don't have to fret. We don't have to give in to fear. We don't have to have worry and anxiety. We don't have to have any of that stuff. God is with us. I tell you what, when I came up for promotion for, to major, I was full of worry and anxiety. I allowed the flesh into my life. I, you know, I, the devil saying, oh, you're not going to get promoted. When I was waiting for my name to come out on that list, I just, I just knew for the back of my mind, oh, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. 
That's what the enemy was trying to tell me. But I made it. Amen. God is with us. Yes. He's with us when we do make it, and he's still with us when we don't make it. Amen. That's right. He's always with us. That's right. And when we don't make it to something that we want in life, it's because he's got something greater Amen. in store for us. That's right. He said, that's not good enough. This ahead of you is better. Amen. So don't fret. Don't worry. Don't give in. God is with us in our life. Before I close, I want to talk to you about Joshua chapter 6. It's the story of Joshua conquering Jericho, that famous story. And as, you know, they didn't just, the walls just didn't fall down around Jericho. There was a process. Firstly, the priests had to go around the city seven times. And as they went, what did they do? They carried the Ark of the Covenant, but before they carried the Ark of the Covenant, they also had praisers and shafar blowers, trumpeters, if you will. They were blowing the shafars as they went around the city. Each day, one time they went around. Each day they went around the city. And on the seventh day, they went around that city. And with the shouts of praise, the blaring of the shafar, with the Ark of the Covenant in tow, the walls came tumbling down. And they rushed in and conquered that city. God gave them the victory. It wasn't because of anything else. They didn't have a demolition team with explosives. It was God. Amen. Through the sound of the shafar and their praises. What is your shafar today? It is your praise to God. It is your shout to God. It is the, the song in your heart. That is your shafar today. When you can drive down the road and put your favorite word, praise and worship song on and you start singing top of your lungs, that's your shafar. When you're in church and maybe you're humming because we're not supposed to really, you know, sing so loud, right? That's still your shafar. When you're on your hands and knees at home in prayer, and you're crying out to God in praise and worship and adoration. That is your shafar. Amen. It is a cry of triumph over the enemy and the forces of darkness. It is saying to God that I know, God, you are victorious. You rule and reign over my life. This is my shout. This is my praise. This is my giving glory and honor to you alone. You give me a shafar to blow inside, and that's what I'm doing. Each and every one of us as Christians has an eternal shofar of love. And that's a shout of praise to God. So I encourage you, shout it out. To praise Him more. To give Him that glory and honor that He alone deserves. Get in that prayer closet. And in that prayer closet, don't just pray about your wants and your needs. But spend some active, real time praising Him for everything He has given you. And everything He's going to give you and do. And everything in life. Praise Him. Amen. Praise Him for those bad times as well as the good. Amen. That's, right. That's your shofar. That's your praise. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that we will all realize that there's a shofar inside of each and every one of us. The shouts and songs of praise to your great and marvelous and mighty deeds. Lord, we love you and want to honor you and glorify you in all that we say and do. Forgive us for allowing the world and its ideas and thoughts and desires to filter into our minds and our hearts. We surrender totally to you and your will in our lives. Forgive us of all our sins. We repent of our sin and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, the Son of the Most High and Living God. We confess with our mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord for the praise and glory of the Father. And that there's no other gods, no other little g-gods before you. Lord, live big in our lives through the Holy Spirit with all the gifts and fruits of ministry you want us to have. Thank you, Lord, for your love. And we choose you above all things. In Jesus, your holy name we pray and declare. Amen. Amen. God is great and greatly to be praised. God is to be given that praise and glory above all things. So when you leave here today, I encourage each and every one of you to walk away knowing God is with you. Amen. And 
It's with you through the Holy Spirit living inside of your heart. Because the Bible tells us when we're saved, we give our lives to the Lord. We repent of our sins, confess his name. We are saved, healed, delivered, set free. We're water baptized. He lives inside of our hearts. Amen. The Holy Spirit is there. We have the gifts of the Holy Spirit inside of us. And he is with us every day. Don't feel lonely. Don't feel like you don't have a friend in the world. Because there is no other friend greater than Jesus. Amen. Remember that old hymn? What a friend we have in Jesus. Amen. Jesus is our friend. Amen. Amen. So let's all stand. And I'm going to bless you as a release today. To, to release you from this service. That you're not dismissed. None of us are dismissed in God. But we are free to go in Jesus' name. But uh, just receive this blessing. Heavenly Father, I pray that your hand of blessing be upon each and every one of us today. May your grace and your mercy and your love go with us. May your glory be our frontal salt in our rear guard. Your glory be our defense. To guard us, protect us, and keep us safe from all harm. Be with us, Lord. Give us supernatural strength to turn our eyes from the foolish, the worst, the lustful things of this world. Instead, may we have the insight to see the beautiful things that you have in store for our lives. Bless us, Lord. Take care of us and guide us. And may you grow powerfully inside each and every one of us today. In Jesus' holy name, be with us. Amen. 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 You are free to go in Jesus' name. Be blessed.